Bloomberg Audio Studios. Podcasts, radio, news. This is the Bloomberg Daybreak Europe podcast, available every morning on Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen. It's Thursday, the 29th of August in London. I'm Stephen Carroll. Coming up today, shares in NVIDIA tumble after the company's results fail to live up to investor hopes, despite meeting or beating expectations across the board. French prosecutors charge the CEO of Telegram over the app's alleged criminal use. Plus, rich pickings why think tanks are lobbying the Labour government to hike taxes on the country's wealthiest. Let's start with a roundup of our top stories. Shares in Nvidia tumbled in after hours trading after it failed to live up to investor hype with its latest set of results. The chip giant is expecting revenues of $32.5 billion for the current quarter, slightly above consensus expectations, but far from the blowout numbers markets have become used to. News of production snags with its next generation Blackwell chips added to the disappointment. But speaking to Bloomberg, NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang defended the rollout. We're going to have lots and lots of supply and uh, we will be able to ramp uh, starting in Q4. We have billions of dollars of revenues and we'll ramp from there into Q1, into Q2 and through next year. We're going to have a great next year as well. Jensen Huang's bullish sentiment wasn't enough. NVIDIA dropping almost 7% in late trading. The disappointing outlook threatens to dampen the AI frenzy that has transformed NVIDIA into the world's second most valuable company. As NVIDIA struggles to meet lofty hopes for AI-generated profit, another leader in the industry is gaining more investor backing. Bloomberg understands that OpenAI is getting closer to raising funding at a valuation of more than $100 billion in a round led by a $1 billion investment from Thrive Capital. The financing would create one of the world's most valuable venture-backed startups, underscoring growing demand for generative artificial intelligence. The CEO, or excuse me, uh, French prosecutors, the CEO of messaging app Telegram has been charged over alleged criminal activity on the platform. The decision comes days after he was stopped at a French airport. Bloomberg's Tiwa Adebayo has the details. The charges against Pavel Durov paint a picture of a platform almost entirely uncooperative with authorities. That's what Paris prosecutors had to say as they ordered the Telegram chief to post €5 million bail and forbade him from leaving France yesterday. Durov has been questioned by police for four days as part of an investigation into the possible criminal responsibility of the platform's executives. Allegations against him include refusing to help agencies run legal wiretaps on suspects. For their part, Telegram says its CEO has nothing to hide, but the charges, as they stand, appear to include a maximum sentence of 10 years. In London, Tiwa Adebayo, Bloomberg Radio. Israel has launched a large-scale military operation in the West Bank. The army says they're trying to combat what they describe as terrorist activity. Palestinian officials say 10 people have been killed and 11 others injured in the raids, which also saw soldiers block access to hospitals. Former US Defence Secretary William Cohen says this operation would have been planned for some time. As far as the West Bank is concerned, I think the Israelis have adopted a policy of preemption. They are not going to wait to be attacked. They were seeing a plan evolve with Hezbollah in Lebanon, mm. and they attacked. They're going to do the same thing in the West Bank. I don't think this came about overnight. I think this was long in the planning. I don't think the Biden administration or Biden-Harris administration had any foreknowledge of this. William Cohen speaking there to Bloomberg Television. The Israeli military said the operation was a preemptive strike, claiming Iran has been smuggling weapons into the West Bank. A spokesman for the Palestinian presidency in the West Bank said the IDF's moves will not bring security and stability to anyone. Thames Water says it will have to increase the amount it charges consumers by nearly 60% to stay afloat. The UK's largest Water Company doubled down on proposals for blockbuster fee increases in the next six years. It's a challenge to the regulator Offwatch, which has already rejected a plan to up fees by a smaller amount. Thames Water's CEO says the rules imposed in it make it uninvestable. It needs to find £3.3 billion by next May to stay solvent. And Labour's tax plans have become the focus of intense lobbying efforts as the new government looks for ways to raise more revenue. Left-wing think tanks are pushing for higher taxes. Representatives for the mega-rich are warning of possible fire sales and their clients leaving the UK. Bloomberg's James Wilcock has more. 
It was these words that kick-started the speculation. I will be honest with you, there is a budget coming in October and it's going to be painful. We have no other choice given the situation that we're in. Those with the broadest shoulders should bear the heavier burden. After Keir Starmer's speech, the question many are asking is who is in the crosshairs to pay more? The IPPR, a think tank well known for its influence on Labour, say it should be those benefiting from capital gains, expensive properties and large inheritances. Banking stocks also dropped in London yesterday as traders bet they too could be targets. Labour's top team face a tough balance with raising revenue to meet their promises of a better state without cutting off the UK's growth, which in a sudden reversal finds itself at the top of the G7. In London, James Wilcock, Bloomberg Radio. Now in a moment we'll bring you our interview with the NVIDIA CEO and talk you through the reaction that we've seen on markets to those results. But first, do you know what a resto mod is? I didn't, I have to admit. It's a classic car that's been restored and modified from the original. Traditionally the sort of thing that you might have found a neighbour tinkering with in a garage. But our colleague Hannah Elliott has been writing about how uh, the... uh, idea of a resto mod has gone very upscale and now people are reworking luxury cars from Porsches to Lamborghinis. Hannah's latest piece is a window into this world. It's not just a hobby anymore, but something that's become a small niche industry producing high-end products with better craftsmanship, improved technology and bespoke detailing and sky-high prices to match. So the models that are created are rare, sometimes unique. They're also increasingly nostalgic as the world turns towards electric cars it's a fascinating piece why car collectors are paying through the nose for resto mods. You'll find it on Bloomberg.com and on the terminal. Let's bring you more now on those results from NVIDIA, which disappointed investors with an underwhelming forecast and news of production issues with its next generation chips. NVIDIA CEO Jensen Huang has been speaking to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow. They began by discussing the issues with the Blackwell chips. Here are some of the highlights of that conversation. We have started volume production. Uh, volume production will ship in Q4, Q4, we will have billions of dollars of Blackwell revenues, and um, we will ramp from there. We will ramp from there. The demand for Blackwell far exceeds its supply, of course, in the beginning, uh, because the demand is so great. Uh, But we're going to have lots and lots of supply, and uh, we will be able to ramp. uh, Starting in Q4, we have billions of dollars of revenues, and we'll ramp from there into Q1, into Q2, and through next year. We're going to have a great next year as well. Jensen, what is the demand for accelerated computing beyond the hyperscalers and meta? Hyperscalers represent about 45% of our total data center business. We're relatively diversified today. We have hyperscalers. uh, We have uh, internet service providers. We have uh, sovereign AIs. We have industries enterprises so it's fairly fairly diversified uh, aside outside of hyperscalers the other 55 percent now the application use across all of that all of that data center uh, starts with accelerated computing accelerated computing uh, does everything of course from the models the, the things that we know about which is generative AI and that g- gets most of the attention um, but at the core we also do uh, database processing, pre and post processing of of, uh, of data before you uh, use it for generative AI, um, transcoding, scientific simulations, computer graphics, of course, image processing, of course, and so there's tons of applications that people use our uh, accelerated computing for, and one of them is uh, generative AI. Let's see, what else can I say? I think that's uh, that well, covers Let me jump it. in, Jensen, please, on, on sovereign AI. You and I have talked about that before. And it was so interesting to hear something behind it that in this fiscal year, there will be low double digit, I think you said billions of dollars in sovereign AI sales. But to the layperson, what does that mean? It, it means deals with specific governments. If so, where? It's not necessarily. Uh, sometimes it it's, uh, deals with um, a particular uh, regional service provider that's been funded by the government and oftentimes that's the case in a case of in a case of japan for example the the japanese government came out and offered subsidies of a couple billion dollars i think for several different uh, internet companies and telcos to be able to fund 
their AI infrastructure. India has a, a sovereign AI initiative going and they're uh, building their AI infrastructure. Uh, Canada, uh, the UK, France, Italy, I'm missing somebody. Uh, Singapore, Malaysia, you know, a large number of countries are subsidizing their regional data centers so that they could become able to uh, build out their AI infrastructure. They recognize that their country's knowledge, their country's data, digital data, is also their natural resource. Not just the land they're sitting on, not just the air above them, uh, but they, they realize now that their, their digital knowledge is part of their natural and national resource. And they ought to harvest that and process that and transform it into their national digital yes. intelligence. And so this is a, this is what we call sovereign AI. You could imagine almost every single country in the world uh, will uh, e eventually recognize this and build out their AI infrastructure. Jensen, you explained clearly that demand to build generative AI products on models or even at the GPU level is greater than current supply. In Blackwell's case in particular, explain the supply dynamics to me for your products and whether you see an improvement sequentially quarter on quarter or at some point by the end of fiscal year into next year. Well, the fact that we're growing would suggest that our supply is improving and our supply chain is, is uh, quite large, one of the largest supply chains in the world. Uh, we have incredible partners and they're doing a great job supporting us in our growth. As you know, we're one of the fastest growing technology companies in history, and none of that would have been possible without very strong demand, but also very strong supply. Uh, we're expecting Q3 to have more supply than Q2. We're expecting Q4 to have more supply than Q3, and we're expecting Q1 to have more supply than Q4. And so I think our supply our supply condition going into next year will be, in a, will be a, a, a large improvement over this last year. That's the CEO of NVIDIA, Jensen Huang, speaking to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow just after their results were published. Now, you can listen to that interview in full on the Bloomberg Talks podcast, all of our key conversations with decision makers in one place. But we want to focus next on the market reaction shares in NVIDIA falling almost 7% in after hours in the back of those results. At one point, they were down over 8%. We've got Bloomberg TV anchor Kriti Gupta with us for more on the market reaction. This is one of those things, if you look at the numbers, NVIDIA met or beat expectations on, on every be measure based on what markets were expecting, the consensus expectations. Why wasn't that enough? This is what happens when you're an A plus student. Uh, and this is this is the this is the downside. Something you're not of that. familiar with at all. I, I'm sure, I have Chris. no idea. No 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 clue whatsoever. As I'm sure you have no clue no. whatsoever. Look, this is this is a really important piece of the equation because you've seen it in other companies before. You've seen this in Microsoft as Asia product. You've seen it in Apple as well, where you have these gains of. Uh, I'm going to give you Microsoft as an example. 30, 40 percent in the product, and enough starts your the market starts to expect that. So when you get to say 29 percent one quarter, it actually takes a big hit. You're seeing the exact same dynamic with NVIDIA here, where you've seen these massive bumps and beats quarter over quarter, that it's the margin of the beat that matters now. That margin of the beat is that came in softer than expected. And that's what tanked the stock. Simply that you, maybe you didn't get an A++ this quarter. You got an a minus or an A, um, and and I'm sure that you know translates very well for for how grading system in, in Europe works. But I think this is important, especially when it comes to where the growth is coming from. Because if you looked at the data centers demand, still very good. If you look at uh, some of the gaming chips demand, which remember Nvidia came to fruition or came to promise because of their visual gaming chip, that was kind of their their cl original claim to fame. Look at their automotive units. That actually came in softer than expected. That's not unfamiliar to what we're seeing here in, in the EV space. I should also add, even though you had some really good numbers across the board, some really good beats, they're also talking about a $50 billion buyback for the share as well. And yet the market didn't respond to that. So I'm curious what happens at the US Open today. Yeah, definitely one to watch. I mean, look, this is a company that's so large, though, that it's also a macro story. What's the sort of broader market reaction? Well, this is uh, coming with a little bit of concern. I should preface this by saying going into NVIDIA earnings for for the first time in the last couple of quarters, you actually had investors look at downside protection. So I'm going to get a little nerdy here, but the options market was actually looking at how you hedge a downside in NVIDIA to the point that the five most traded contracts in the S&P 500 were NVIDIA put. So basically that insurance against a drop. And this is a really big deal because in previous iterations, there has been no downside protection. People were really 100% on the NVIDIA train. And this is the first time you kind of saw some jitters, which has only been magnified since you got those results. 
add on the fact that you got numbers out of Salesforce, yeah. you got numbers out of CrowdStrike, both of which missed on their on their revenue. And of course, NVIDIA didn't miss on their revenue, but they didn't beat as high. And a lot of that is because enterprise demand right now. So your businesses, your big corporates that are investing in uh, computer infrastructure or AI, et cetera, aren't doing it with as much enthusiasm as they did before. That's where the slowing demand is coming from, whereas consumer demand and consumer products are ramping up. Remember, we have, um, in addition to the tech space, we have a, a Apple iPhone debut on September 9th, where they're going to be revealing their first gen AI iPhone. And that's a big deal deal because it speaks to the idea of how much consumer adoption, regular like regular mass uh, consumer adoption actually is attracted to an AI product, whereas before, and all this investment is mostly coming from a lot of the bigger companies, and that's where the CapEx spend is coming from. Yeah, and of course, all of that very much feeding into the outperformance of the Mag 7 and what we've seen on markets. Look, let's think about what we should be looking at next. We're watching chip makers in Asia this morning, in Europe, later US hours. What are the key benchmarks you're watching? Well, you already said TSMC shares uh, take a little bit of a beating in the Asia session, but in terms of the broader market reaction, you actually aren't seeing as bad of a reaction as expected. People were expecting this to be this big macro event when it comes to things uh, like uh, the South Korean index, for mm-hmm. example, which is very heavily weighted towards chips, uh, Japan, crypto, bonds, etc. You're not seeing that macro reaction. And I wonder how much of this is because a lot of the pain points in NVIDIA had to do with delays in their Blackwell chips specifically, as opposed to saying, well, AI demand is ending. This is Bloomberg Daybreak Europe, your morning brief on the stories making news from London to Wall Street and beyond. Look for us on your podcast feed every morning on Apple, Spotify and anywhere else you get your podcasts. You can also listen live each morning on London DAB Radio, the Bloomberg Business app and Bloomberg.com. Our flagship New York station is also available on your Amazon Alexa devices. Just say, Alexa, play Bloomberg 1130. I'm Caroline Hepke. And I'm Stephen Carroll. Join us again tomorrow morning for all the news you need to start your day, right here on Bloomberg Daybreak Europe.